but I'd like you all to close your eyes for a moment and imagine yourself watching a scientist hard at work. Okay, what did it look like? What did you see? Was it someone you know or someone that was famous? Were they wearing a lab coat? In a recent poll last year, 81% of Americans apparently couldn't name a single living scientist, which provoked the um, Twitter hashtag actual living scientist to take over the internet. So let's get this out of the way first. My name's Edward Wenger, I'm a Lakeside class of 1999, and I'm an actual living scientist. <laughs> Okay, so that's good. Now we're all in the 19%, so we're starting from there. Um, but that's kind of sad, right? Because science is super important. I know I'm biased, uh, but science is the driving force behind most of the advancements in energy, in medicine, in technology that affect our lives every single day. So, when you are going into the voting booth, when you are reading the news, when you are making personal healthcare decisions for your family, you are a consumer of scientists, of science. So what I'd like to talk about today is uh, my story. My story as a scientist on the front lines, breaking down that boundary between the things that we think we know and the things that we suspect but haven't yet observed. And specifically talk about two pieces of that. The first is that science is messy, and the second is that scientists are often wrong. Okay, so in 2003, my career began as an experimental nuclear physicist. We were really, really excited in the properties of matter, how it behaved under the hottest, densest conditions that characterized the early universe in the first microsecond after the Big Bang. How do we do that? Well, we have these giant accelerators, and we speed up heavy ions like lead or gold, and we'd smash them together at 99.9999% of the speed of light. And then all the particles would go flying through these giant detectors, and we'd use those to measure them and infer, have we created a quark gluon plasma? That's what we were trying to do. And we thought we had, and that's basically because of two reasons. The first is something called collective flow, okay? So when these two heavy ions smash into each other in off-centered collisions, they made this oblong collision zone. And the bulk properties of what came flying out of that were consistent with this idea that there was an early equilibration of that system and a hydrodynamic expansion such that particles would fly more and faster in one direction than the other. And the other was a phenomenon called jet quenching. So in collisions of protons with each other, sometimes you get a direct scattering of the quarks and gluons inside those protons that would result in a spray of high energy particles going on. And that happens too in collisions of lead ions or gold ions except it's happening inside this potential quark gluon plasma. So we thought we had a theory that most of the jets we saw in that system were coming from the surface and the away side partner had basically completely disappeared. So my project was this. My project was to look much more closely at the widening of the jet cone on the near side and to look more closely at where all that energy had dissipated to and to use that to learn more about this quark gluon plasma. So here we are in 2005. We're building on top of this foundation of understanding relativity and quantum chromodynamics, the theory of the strong force. We think we have a relatively self-consistent understanding of jet quenching and collective flow. And here's me out there at this little pink point thinking I'm going to measure the quark gluon plasma through jet modification. And another group had done that before. They're that little blue dot there. Um, but we thought we could do it in a way that was a little different because our detector went further up and down the beam line. So we did this, and it was super hard, and it took like two and a half years. And we we're trying to correct for all the little holes in our detector, and we we're trying to subtract out the effects of collective flow on our measurement. And what we think we measured was that this actual widening, this apparent widening of the near side cone, went as far as we could measure up and down the jet, up and down the beam line. And that was actually a giant problem. Because that meant we didn't understand anything at all. That meant most of the theories that thought the quark gluon plasma was smearing this stuff out had a causality problem. You'd have to believe that the information was traveling faster than the speed of light to keep these things correlated with each other. So here we are in 2008, actually knowing less than we knew in 2005 when we started. But 
At the same time, in the same building, just down the hall, my advisor, Gunter, and a fellow student, Burak, were working on a separate problem. They were trying to figure out, well, this collective flow thing that I told you about, in these oblong systems, this asymmetry of stuff going one way more than another. Even in the most directly head-on collisions, you still saw this, and that doesn't make sense because this is supposed to be symmetric, so where's that coming from? And they finally had this aha moment, right? Oh, wait, on average they're symmetric, but maybe, maybe in, in any individual head-on collision, there's these little asymmetries, right? And that's gonna drive that signature. And after going through that, they thought about my measurement and said, wait a second, I think we can describe this all under the same consistent theory of these initial collision geometry fluctuations. And so my point is, I went out trying to find one thing, and we found actually the complete opposite. And that's okay, before you start feeling super sorry for me that my only contribution to science after three years was a non-observation of something. Well, we actually, the next year, went and measured at a bigger detector and a bigger collider, actually jet modifications, and we did that just a year late. But my point is, unlike how they kind of teach it in high school, big names in science directed, it's Galileo, it's Newton, it's Einstein, science is messy. Right? Science is actually the contributions of many people after many false starts, making many small breakthroughs. And that's important to know. That's important to know if you're a student who's thinking of getting into science, beware. Or as a taxpayer who's actually paying for a lot of these big telescopes or big colliders or big fusion reactors. So that's where that part of the story ends. In 2011, I completely changed careers and I became a computational epidemiologist. What's that? Um, so we build computer models of infectious diseases, how they transmit. We compare those to observations of case data. And we try and um, apply that. We try and apply that to describe what's happening and why. To describe where a disease is going to go next and when. And to um, predict and prescribe how we can take the most effective actions. And that's something my group uh, at IBM over in Bellevue has been doing since 2007 in malaria and polio, TB, and HIV. Now, you may recall that in 2014 there was a pretty large Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And by late summer of that year, some of the trends in the observed cases were really very alarming. And a number of groups who were in my line of work doing infectious disease modeling were trying to understand this data in the context of their models and make predictions about what was going to happen. Um, people were doing that different ways, but a lot of people were doing it kind of like this. They were taking flu models, or models of how diseases that had been sort of adapted from that use case, and they were trying to apply them to sort of country-level data like this, right? Um, and you guys kind of know how the story ends, I suppose. There weren't millions of cases after all, but this isn't to talk about the fact that scientists are wrong. This is to talk about why scientists are wrong. So let's dig into that in a couple more details. Um, the first problem with applying a model where transmissions happen between infections and random strangers is while that might be a reasonable approximation for some types of airborne diseases like flu or measles, uh, we know that's not how Ebola works. We know Ebola is a contact disease, a disease of close contact with very dramatic symptoms, such that if you are aware of Ebola in your community, you can take specific actions, you can make changes in your behavior that minimize your risk. Okay, so we already knew that. And the second problem was one of data interpretation. The idea that the relevant data for fitting a model to try and understand Ebola was at the country level, rather than looking a bit deeper. Right? So already by September of 2014, it was clear that although at the country level cases were still rising, it was clear that if you looked at district level or even at villages within districts, that the mechanism that was responsible for subsiding cases wasn't the fact that every single person had been infected or vaccinated like in flu or measles or something like that. It was something completely different. And so by September, it should have already been, and for a number of people, was possible to predict that there were thousands of cases, not millions of cases. So what's the lesson there? Well, we have people all the time who actually care about not getting the right answer from science, and, and you should too. Um, because they want to predict the future, they want to know how many facilities they should build next month to be prepared for the number of Ebola cases or applications like that. And all the smart people who are asking us as consumers of our work ask the same two questions. And one is, how are you interpreting the data? And the other is, what assumptions are you making underlying this, 
this conclusion you're coming to. And that's something we should all do, right? That's something you can do when you're reading the news. That's something you can do when you're deciding how you want to vote. And that's something you can do uh, when making personal health care decisions for your family. You don't have to be a consumer of scientific conclusions. You can be a consumer of assumptions, consumer of interpretations. So, scientists are not encyclopedias. Sometimes we know a lot, and sometimes that makes us fun trivia partners, as long as it's not all 90s pop songs or something like that. Um, but science is actually the process of breaking down boundaries, right? Science is messy, scientists are often wrong. But if we can remember that, when we interact with science in our own lives, it's going to be a lot more constructive. So thank you.